Patrick, we know in the region there's a lot of trade platforms uh, under negotiation or being formed. The two most uh, famous one is TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and RCEP, which is ASEAN-centric. To some extent, uh, it would have serious implication for Hong Kong uh, as well as for the region. But the problem is that Hong Kong is in neither one of those platforms. It's unlikely to be in any one of those anytime soon. So to what extent you think that it will have an impact on Hong Kong when these two platforms or one of those get materialized and we are, lot, we are left out? You know, Hong Kong has always been very serious about multilateralism and about non-discriminatory trade. And I think that is the bedrock of, of sound policy for, for Hong Kong. Uh, the second one is that Hong Kong is very, very dependent on trade. So this matters very much. Now, these are obvious points, but I think that's the backdrop. The, tr the, the issue with TPP and with uh, RCEP is multidimensional. There are many aspects of this. In some ways, I think TPP is really part of geopolitics as well as trade, and I think that complicates matters. The geopolitics turn principally on China not being part of the TPP. So whatever good work the TPP can do in terms of opening markets for its, it, the parties to it and creating better opportunities and, and, and getting the efficiency gains of specialization through trade, I, I'm afraid that there's going to be quite a lot of trade diversion involved in the TPP. And there are uh, countries that have been mentioned such as Thailand and economies such as Taiwan that potentially stand to, to suffer quite a bit of trade diversion. Now, one would have to look more carefully at the situation for Hong Kong, but the Hong Kong economy is very much tied to China. So I think there is an issue there. RCEP is a little more complicated, precisely because RCEP will, be, will include China, and the Hong Kong economy is tied significantly to China, by no means exclusively, but significantly. The interesting thing about, about the rest of RCEP is that Hong Kong's trade and investment relationships have been picking up quite significantly. You've seen a doubling of investment into ASEAN in the, in the last two or three years. You've seen a growth rate of trade of something in the region of 10% with ASEAN. And of course, that translates also into pretty significant increases with some of the other members of RCEP, the other six countries, uh, Japan, Korea, China, India, Australia and New Zealand. So I think there's a lot of potential in, the, in those relationships and I think not being in there potentially will have certain disadvantages for Hong Kong. Perhaps one way of ameliorating that is to push ahead with the free trade agreement which is currently being considered or even negotiated now between Hong Kong and, and the ASEAN countries and maybe to see that as a platform for getting a, a, a full-fledged access through RCEP. Some people say that this is to Hong Kong's advantage of being a free port, being a loyal supporter of multilateralism. But some, sometimes people say that this, it is a disadvantage because there's nothing more you can offer when you go into a free trade agreement negotiation with your counterparty. Which way you think is more closer to the truth? If we look at it from the point of view of the others, the others might say, look, you don't have much that we want because you've already given it to us. And then if we were to be humorous about it, we might say, well, Hong Kong might, should quickly put up some barriers so they have something to negotiate. But I don't think that's a very serious proposition. So the, the issue then would be why, they might say, should we make any uh, uh, concessions to you in this negotiation in terms of improving your access to our markets if there's going to be no reciprocity. And I think that to some extent is, is, is a challenge, but I think it's a bit of an oversimplification as well because although Hong Kong is a very free and open economy, it's not completely free. There are areas where Hong Kong maintains barriers, particularly in the services sector, some, some uh, professional services, possibly business services. So there is something to put on the table. And I think that that might be worth uh, investigating uh, in, 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 and seeing what there the really is. And I think already Hong Kong has some good access 
on services, at least the trade on services has been fairly significant with uh, ASEAN and, and the other countries in, in that grouping. So maybe, maybe it's, um, it's going to be less black and white in terms of, well, you've given everything anyway, so let's forget it. Uh, but I certainly think that the counter argument that you make is, what do you have to fear? Um, has some, some, some weight as well. How about Hong Kong as a conduit or a transiting point or entry point to other markets like China? We have a shipper with the mainland. Can we use as a leverage in negotiating with other counterparties? Potentially, but there are two questions I'd ask about that. One is, are the origin rules in SIPA going to be sufficiently generous so that, the, that Hong Kong can indeed do that? with significant content from the uh, ASEAN uh, countries. And the second is they might say, well, we already have ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus China, and do we not get what we need from there? I, I don't know. I don't know what the, what the, what the, what the answer is to, to that, because the actual transiting I issue may be quite separate. Um, it, it really depends, I think, more on the SEPA arrangements.